communications. Nobody expected anything but a win from Pitt on Saturday. The only question was, could they win big? That question was answered with a big Y-E-S. Pitt, behind Dan Marino and Julius Dawkins, blew out Cincinnati to make it two in a row. So far in 1981, this pit schedule has been ideal for Jackie Sherrill. It's ideal because it's a coach's schedule, and it's given Jackie time to take this young, aggressive team that he has and mold it into what could become a national powerhouse. Saturday, Cincinnati was never in it. The pit defense, with only two regulars back from last year, has not given up a touchdown yet. The pit opponents down the road are going to have to think long and hard about trying to run on this defense. Against Cincinnati, it was another excellent day for the new, young defensive front. If not for a blocked punt late in the game, they would have had a shutout. And when you score 38 points, you know the offense enjoyed themselves, too. Dan Marino had one of the best days he's ever had at Pitt, and he did that without his number one receiver, Dwight Collins. He sat out the game with a pulled hamstring. The fans on Saturday spent most of the day looking up at one of the best air shows in Pitt history. And all day long, it was Dan Marino to number 80, Julius Dawkins. He had eight catches, four of them for touchdowns. have all the action and the story of Panther Pride, which is brought to you by Westinghouse and the 140,000 Westinghouse employees worldwide. By Miller High Life, if you've got the time, we've got the beer. And by Golf Oil, who suggests you try Golf Super Unleaded, the gas with guts. It helps eliminate knocks and pings. Practices during the two-week layoff after the win over Illinois obviously had Pitt fired up and ready to play. And the defense made it clear that they were going to pick up where they left off two weeks ago, and that meant trouble for the Cincinnati offense. They got an early introduction to Mr. Sinceri for a loss of three. Mr. Pelusi, and a loss of 11. Cincinnati quarterback Danny Barrett found out in a hurry that he was going to have to hurry if he had any intention of putting the ball up. And some of the players who introduced themselves to Pitt fans two weeks ago introduced themselves to the guys in the white shirts and let them know they were in for a long, frustrating day. Dan Marino didn't have Dwight Collins, but he did have his old mobility, and he had Barry Compton. And he had Julius Dawkins, and he had time to throw, thanks to the guys like freshman Bill Fralick, who no longer had to worry about the pressure of the preseason buildup. I don't feel the pressure is off me because every game I think every player puts pressure on himself to perform as well as he can and uh, we got hopefully 10 more games and I hope I keep improving week by week. When you've got somebody 6'5", 270 up there in front of you, you like to run behind him too and Joe McCall took advantage of the opening. Dan Marino mixed the run and the pass well and kept the Cincinnati defense honest by throwing off it on first down. And Barry Compton obliged by catching everything in the neighborhood. And when Cincinnati started thinking pass on first down, it was time to draw. Draw a train. And then it's time for Act One of the Dan and Julius show. On this one, Julius is asked to ad lib a little bit, and he does right into the end zone. He was called a, a 51, which is about a five yard out. And uh, uh, he called it and he threw it and I caught it. And it's just the man, I caught him, I threw a move on him and he slipped and fell and you know, I went in the end zone. And a two point conversion made it eight nothing fit. It was the beginning of the end of Cincinnati and the beginning of the end of some pit passing and receiving records. Rick Dukovich was enjoying the show so much he wanted to see a little more. And when Dwayne Chisholm fumbled Eric Schubert's kickoff, it was time for an encore. Time for the Dan and Julia show, act two. With one of the stars giving some credit to the supporting cast. 
probably the biggest key was our offensive line protection. They did a great job. Also, our, our receivers did a good job running their patterns. They caught the ball well today. After Cincinnati's usual three plays in a punt, it was time to go right back to work. And just because Marino is back in the shotgun doesn't mean you're about to see a pass. You just might see Wayne DeBartola. This time it's good for six yards. After the Illinois game, when Barry Compton came off the bench to fill in for Dwight Collins, Dan Marino said, Barry has to be a part of this offense. He was a big part of Pitt's third touchdown drive. And the more you see of Compton, the more you agree with Dan Marino's assessment, Barry Compton has to be a major part of the Pitt offense. You know Dan Marino will be a major part of the Pitt offense. He has been since he set foot on the Pitt campus. And Pitt fans still have almost two years left of cheering for the kid from Oakland. A big reason for Dan Marino staying home to go to Pitt is Dan Marino Sr., who still lives right down the street. I wait for my father to come home and we go down the field and catch baseball or throw football or whatever, or just, just talk. And, uh, I think that helped me a lot. Probably your best coach you'll ever have in your life is your dad. And, and one thing that he did for me is he, he would spend the time with me, which is probably the most important thing, is spending time is just, just uh, practice and repetitiveness and, and just going down the field every day and practicing. And that's probably, probably the biggest thing is spending the time with you. People in Pittsburgh knew all about Dan Marino before he went to Pitt. He made quite a name for himself at Pittsburgh Central Catholic. Well, when I chose Pitt uh, to play football, I had a couple goals, and one was one was to become the starting quarterback for Pitt, and two was to be on a winning program for four years. My dad helped me in a lot of ways choosing Pitt. One was because I, I wanted him to see me play because he's helped me out so much in my career, and also for the rest of my family to see me play at Pitt. When Dan chose Pitt, myself and our family are just elated that he did. Uh, I think it was his decision to make. We just, uh, I just tried to point out the, the points to him of staying home versus going away. And when it got down to the final decision, uh, Dan made his own decision where he wanted to go because he's the one that had to be there wherever he chose to go for the four years. And I think he made a very wise decision by going to the University of Pittsburgh. Well, I think uh, I'm in a unique situation where I probably wouldn't be able to do this if I went to school anywhere else in the country, and I think this is probably one of the advantages I looked at when I was deciding to come to Pitt. I think it's, uh, it's good from the standpoint where I could come home when I want for dinner or whatever, just to talk, talk about the game, just talk about anything, and I think it's an advantage for me, and it, it has helped me through the years. Everybody who follows Pitt football is familiar with Dan Marino, but the big lead made it possible for some people who don't often get a chance to get their names on the stat page, like Bill Wallace, a sophomore split end, and a junior split end named Keith Williams, and a big 219-pound sophomore fullback, Bill Beach. And Jackie Sherrill should feel good about having these guys around for a while. Jackie will have Dan Marino for the rest of this season and all of next season. And sometime this season, if he stays healthy, Marino will become Pitt's all-time passing leader. Cincinnati tried to show some sign of life. But just when it looked as though they might get something going, the Pitt defense made sure they went nowhere. And that means nowhere. And sometimes it even means less than nowhere. Bill Moss for a loss. Cincinnati quarterback Danny Barrett even found members of the Pitt defensive backfield in his own backfield, and it cost him eight yards. This time it was sophomore safety Tom Flynn on the blitz. And when Barrett did get time to throw, no matter what area he decided to go to, it ended up being a high-risk operation. 
The offense showed their appreciation for what the defense did for them by getting right down to business, and Wayne DiBartola gets right down to business by getting right down to the Cincinnati Nine with a lot of help from the guys up front. When the linebackers don't stunt, it gives the offensive line an opportunity to all block their men. Uh, uh, Bill Fralick, uh, he comes offside and makes a block, and uh, Jimbo Covert's on the strong side, and Emil Bors and Rob Faden, they all made uh, their blocks, and I just cut it right outside and ran down the sideline. No points for Pitt on this trip. A 29-yard field goal attempt by Snuffy Everett was no good. So Jackie Sherrill had to settle for a 21-0 lead at the half. And we'll be back with more on Panther Pride right after this. There was no reason to believe that the second half for Pitt would be any different from the first. The offense moves the ball just about at will. And Dan Marino showed that he can improvise, which means he can scramble. Which also means that the knee he hurt last year must be feeling a little bit better. May as well get the tight end into the act. And this time, a Cincinnati tackler has trouble with John Brown's body. John Brown makes 15 yards out of nothing. And he did it with nothing but second effort. Being 6'4", 225 doesn't hurt. And are you ready for act three of the Dan and Julius show? Cincinnati obviously wasn't ready for it, and it cost them six points. This act can only get better when Dwight Collins gets healthy, and Dawkins, Compton, and Collins are able to play together especially when Dan Marino is throwing the ball like this. Snuffy Everett makes the extra point, and it's 28-0 Pitt, and it's all over. Apparently, nobody told J.C. Pelosi it was all over. Maybe it was 28-0, but he and everybody else on the defense kept playing like it was nothing-nothing. Pizzuli, Moss, and Siri, Craniac, them guys were all over the field. We were pursuing the ball. Sal was calling out every play almost. He does a great job out there. He's a leader, and it's good to have him out there. You won't find too many guys in the white jerseys who will agree that it's nice to have Sal Sinceri or anybody else on the pit defense out there. And when the offense got the ball back, it was the same old story. McCall on the ground. And it was Marino and Compton in the air. No touchdown this time, though. But Snuffy Everett did come through with a 32-yarder. And it's 31 for Pitt, none for Cincinnati. And now it's time for the Cincinnati offensive highlights. Now watch closely. This is their second first down of the game. It comes on a broken play near the end of the third quarter. So much for the Cincinnati highlights. A freshman making his first start decides to end the Cincinnati highlight segment right there with a clothesline. My first start, I was really nervous, so um, I just want to go out and do the best I could. I can't afford to slack off. You know, I'm a freshman. I was going against a senior tight end. You know, he's been around a while. So I just want to go out and do the best I can, try to beat him to the punch. So now it's the offense's turn again. Cue Dan and Julius. 19 more yards. Now mix in a little Wayne DiBartola. DiBartola is one of many Pitt players who knows the advantages of playing football in Pittsburgh. You take a young man and he goes to school for four years or talking about his college education and a lot of places he's just there, he's going to school. But uh, here they have the opportunity to meet uh, the people meet the corporate people, meet the leaders of the corporate world. They have that advantage of, to gain that inside of it, to gain the maturity. They get, uh, to get, have an understanding that, you know, the, of their future. If they're certainly going to be in any type of business, or going to be an engineer, or certainly a doctor, a lawyer, going into private business, going into the corporate world as an accountant, or going into the corporate world as, as a, a manager, 
then they have that advantage. And certainly, uh, when you have a young man that's 18, 19, 20 years of age, uh, that maybe not know what his future is going to be like when he gets out of school, he's got to go compete for a job, but he's here, he meets these people, and he has the understanding that, hey, you know, I'm going to be able to compete and have a job when school is over with, and it makes a big difference. Well, over the years, we've had, we've had many good football players that have worked for us for periods of time. And I think that's what Pittsburgh gives them. It gives them that opportunity to work for various companies for short periods or long periods or, or total career. Between the companies in Pittsburgh and the football players at the University of Pittsburgh, there's sort of a mutual admiration society. One respects the other for what he can do. Now, Pittsburgh is still the third city in the United States with the largest number of corporate headquarters of the cities in this country. So it's a city that has strong corporate presence. And the fact that Pitt is a winning team, and the fact that corporations need universities near them to encourage people to be here, uh, it's just part of the overall success story of the city of Pittsburgh. Well, we're very fortunate to have a coach like Coach Cheryl here in Pittsburgh, and we've had a lot of association with him uh, from day one. Uh, he indicating an interest in the corporations and their relationship to the ball players and the university. Uh, we, in turn, able to communicate with him and to help him uh, in providing opportunities for those ball players. Pittsburgh has been good to Jackie Sherrill when it comes to playing winning football. And when John Brown makes this catch at the end of the third quarter, Pitt is well on its way to its 17th straight win at Pitt Stadium. And as the fourth quarter opens, it's time for Dan and Julius Act Four and another pit touchdown. And Dan Marino moves into fourth place on Pitt's all-time total offense list, and he ties a record with his fifth touchdown pass of the game. A shutout would have been nice, but Cincinnati doesn't seem to want to cooperate. David Hepler's punt is blocked, and Cincinnati makes it 38-7 when Freddie Logan falls on it. The scoreboard shows seven points for Cincinnati, but the Pitt defense knows that nobody scored a touchdown on them. And they know that if South Carolina scores a touchdown on them on October 3rd, it'll be the first one they've given up this season. And we'll be back with more Panther pride right after this. Cheryl worked his team hard during the two-week layoff after the Illinois game, and he should be happy with the results. Certainly defensively played extremely well, chased the ball, made things happen, uh, and Danny played very well. The two weeks of hard work paid off for the players, too, and nobody noticed those results more than they did. I felt offensively the team did a real good job. Uh, in the first quarter, we uh, had some nice drives, and, the, and in the third quarter, we had some nice drives. All the receivers did really well. You know, the line was giving Danny time to, you know, throw the ball. The offense line they did a good job moved the ball they had ball control kept us rested and i feel overall team effort 100 percent everyone gave so now it's another two-week break for pitt and they'll need it to get ready for south carolina jim carlin and his boys remember what happened last year at the gator bowl they should have revenge on their minds in columbia on october 3rd well i think it certainly be on the minds of uh, not only their themselves but also their fans and uh certainly our players but uh it's something it's a new year it's a new game and certainly playing down here is in the heat, playing at night, first night game, and it's certainly, it'll be our first big test. And there are plenty of people around who remember very well what happened down in Jacksonville last December 29th. Ten starters returned for South Carolina this season, but the big loss was Heisman Trophy winner tailback George Rogers. His place has been taken by last year's fullback, Johnny Wright, who has rushed for better than 180 yards in two games. The quarterbacking spot is a 50-50 split between juniors Gordon Beckham and Terry Bishop. Defensively tackle Andrew Province, an All-American candidate, middle guard Emmanuel Weaver, defensive end Phil Ellis, and linebacker Mike Dura, South Carolina's leading tackler, are players to watch. Free safety Robert Perlow leads the secondary. South Carolina will want revenge for what Pitt did to them last year in the Gator Bowl. So in two weeks, it's Pitt in South Carolina, and we'll have all the stories and the action right here on Panther Pride.
Panther Pride has been brought to you by Westinghouse and the 140,000 Westinghouse employees worldwide. By light beer, everything you always wanted in a beer and less. And by Gulf Oil, who suggests you try Gulf Super Unleaded, the gas with guts. It helps eliminate knocks and pings. The executive producer of Panther Pride is Richard L. Clauser. This show was produced and directed by Doug Kennedy. Creative consultant, Guido D'Elia. Associate producer, Bill Dickhout. facilities by TPC Communications Pittsburgh. This has been a TPC production.